Hello, Dominion Church family. Pastor Matthew Hester here. I pray that all is going well with you this week. Uh, thank you for joining us on our online only streaming exclusive. You're going to have a great message from Tim Scipio here in just a few minutes. I know it's going to be a blessing to you. But I did want to share a couple of announcements with you for the month of November. We've got some exciting things coming up. First, on November the 5th, that's the first Friday night in the month of November, we have our Power Surge Supernatural Gathering with a very special guest, Pastor Fred Giles. He pastors Prevail Church in Taylor's, and he's going to be here to bless us, to encourage us. You don't want to miss it. That starts at 7.30 p.m. on November the 5th. On November the 7th, that first Sunday in the month of November, we're having Pastor Appreciation Sunday. We had to reschedule that from the month of October with everything that was going on with Dad's memorial service. And so that's going to be your opportunity to celebrate us. And we are so humbled and grateful for you. And so please come and join us for that Sunday, the 7th, for Pastor Appreciation Sunday. I also want to remind you about the very last Tuesday in the month of November, November the 30th, is Giving Tuesday. And that's a national give back movement for nonprofit organizations. Dominion's been a part of that the last couple of years, and it really has blessed us and empowered us to begin our next calendar year in a strong way financially. Our goal this year is the same as last year. We're, we're believing God for $2,500 to be given above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings on Giving Tuesday. So you'll start seeing some posts about that on our Facebook wall. And remember, what helps to make that a success is that you actually wait, you plan and you wait to give on that Tuesday. And then Facebook matches those gifts up to uh, several million dollars. And so we have the potential to have our $2,500 match dollar for dollar. So that is a great opportunity to help us as a ministry. And then finally, I would like to invite you to give, to be a part of our giving community, our support community here at Dominion Church. There are ways being pulled up on the screen for you to take advantage of that. You can text your amount to that number that you see there on the screen. Very easy to do. You can also give online at dominionchurch.net slash give. We don't take it for granted. Uh, what God has given to us as a ministry to steward, as well as ministering to our capacity to expand and increase, your financial support makes all the difference. So I really do appreciate that. Well, listen, guys, God bless you. Thanks for being a part of this online exclusive. And now we're going to receive from one of my dear friends, and I know it's going to be a blessing to you, Tim Scipio. God bless you guys. Have an amazing time. Good evening, my people in Facebook land and Dominion Church International and all my family and friends and all the friends of Dominion. We are here today having an evening recorded service, and I'm Tim Scipio. I'm one of the leaders at Dominion Church International, and uh, we are here in this fabulous church of Prevail Church. Uh, Pastor Fred Giles has given us the opportunity to be here and, and uh, share tonight here at his, uh, his, his place, and uh, so we appreciate him and all of his family and, and friends allowing us to do this tonight. Uh, I am excited about sharing tonight. Uh, I feel like tonight is a, just a great time for us to kind of be together in this uh, season. We will be back together face to face uh, the next, the following Sunday, and uh, looking forward to that. But tonight we are here in virtual world. So let's pray first, and then we we'll get started on what we're going to be teaching about tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are and and what you desire to communicate to this evening. Jesus, let your word be expressed, let your will be done in your way. Let it be seen in a powerful way, in a loving way. Help us all receive what you need to give us tonight. We thank you for that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. First thing out, I'm going to say it like this. If, therefore, the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Freedom. You know, that, that concept in itself in our great nation means a lot to us. You know, if you're talking about the Declaration of Independence that was declared back 
1776 when we announced our freedom from the tyranny of the King of Great Britain or the Emancipation Clock Proclamation that was declared back on January the 1st, 1863 by Abraham Lincoln, where he declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforth shall be free. Now, you know, when he made those declarations and when those declarations were made in 1776, it didn't just happen, right? It happened when people put forth a concerted effort to enforce and establish that freedom. So it shouldn't be a surprise when Jesus says, therefore, who the son makes free will be free indeed that, hey, maybe the freedom he declared over our lives may also require some type of effort, maybe require some type of established aggression to, to establish in our own personal lives. Now, I think one of the things I want us to get at tonight is the definition of what does God call freedom? What is freedom? And so, especially freedom for a Christian believer. It's an intriguing idea, you know, because in our culture today, our culture communicates a type of freedom on, in, our, in our movies, in our songs, in our relationships and how we conduct ourselves with each other, uh, how we dress. You know, our culture communicates a certain type of freedom. But what is intriguing to me is that many times, that freedom leads us right back into the claws and the slavery of sin. So, how does God define freedom? Does he give us the right to do whatever we want to do? Can we say whatever we want to say, regardless of how it hurts people? Can we treat people any way we want to because that's how we feel in the moment and how the other person feels doesn't really matter. Only how I feel is important. Or can we lie to our loved ones so we can just keep on doing the things we want to do without their knowledge? Now, I know I'm stepping on my, on my toes and also probably on some other people's toes because there are things that we consider our right, the things that we want to do, the things we feel like we need to do, but it's not freedom from God's definition. But Tim, that is my right. Jesus made me free in deed, in action, man. I can do what I want to. Not quite. Not quite. Let me say this. When Jesus was talking to his disciples in John 8 and 36, he was declaring to his audience that anyone that actively practices sin is a slave to sin. So he was offering deliverance from the power of sin and is entrapping to slavery. And so what I'm saying tonight is I want us to look at how the power of sin has many times kept us bound and not free. And I want us all to look at our level of freedom and see how God wants us to be even more free. So freedom defined according to God's definition. So one of the scriptures that Verses we're going to look at, and it's not just one, it's many. I'm going to read and we're going to look at it and see what God says already about our freedom from the power of sin. So Romans chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 18, says, For the death that he died, he died to sin. Now this is from the Amplified Bible. He died to sin, ending its power and paying the sinner's debt once and for all. And the life that he lives, he lives to glorify God in unbroken fellowship with him. I love how that says. 
in unbroken fellowship. And I like how he said, we are dead. He died to sin, ending its power and paying the sinner's debt. So basically, any power that sin had over you, over me, over the world, he counseled it when he died to sin. Verse 11 says, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and your relationship to it broken, but alive to God in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is establishing, or Paul is establishing right here, that because of Jesus, you now can consider yourself dead to sin and your relation to it broken. So there's something there that has been established. There's a freedom there that has been established. We have been made free from the power of sin and our relationship to it is now broken. So in my mind, that's a, that's a certain level of freedom. That's a defined freedom for us. So let's look at that even more so. But alive unto God. So we define freedom by saying I am dead to sin. My relationship to it is broken, but I am now alive to God. Dead to sin, alive to God. Broken relationship with sin, unbroken fellowship with God. Defined freedom. Defined freedom. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. Therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts and passions. So let me say this right here. This is where, like in the Declaration of Independence and the Emancipation Proclamation, there had to be something done in order to make sure you still had that freedom. We still got bodies. You living in this earth suit. I got one, you got one. My son has one. Pastor Fred has one. Everybody has a body, an earth suit. The thing about that earth suit is it still is influenced and can be influenced by the lusts and passions of sin. So, we can be influenced by the lusts and passions of sin. Where? In the body. So how we were raised, how we were, how we were loved or not loved, traumas in our lives, hurts in our lives, sins we committed in the body, all that is memory to the brain. The brain itself has memory, and sometimes we get triggered by how we actually were raised or not loved or whatever happened in our lives or just the lifestyle we live. We have a memory of all that. It's in the brain. It's in the body. It's in the mind. And the body demonstrates those things. Now, sin itself, the power of sin, tries to work itself in our body. So what do we have to do? We have to not let sin reign in our mortal body. Why? Because if we obey the lusts and passions of sin, then you are now offering yourself we keep on reading it says do not go on offering your members of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness but offer yourselves to God in a decisive act as those alive raised from the dead to a new life and your members all of your abilities sanctified set apart as instruments of righteousness yielded to God if you yield yourself to the lusts and passions of sin in the body you really become a slave again to those things. But if you, it says right here, but offer yourself to God in a decisive act. Freedom means you have the ability to choose. A decisive act. You have the ability to choose to not let sin, the power of sin, it's the lust and passions reign in this earth suit that God gave you to be able to express his life in the earth. So this decisive act, man, 
is an act of offering yourself to the Lord. Lord, I need you right now. I am, I am experiencing the, the remembrance of things I've done. I present myself to you right now, God. That thought is coming to me, Father. I, I feel it right now, working on me right now. I'm trying not to do it, so I'm yielding to you right now. Or I'm angry. That person says something to me, and I want to hurt them right now. But, Lord, you said be angry but don't sin. I offer myself up to you. You have to make a decisive decision or act in order to not let sin reign in your body, reign in your mind, in order for you not to let the lust and the passions of sin overcome you. It says here, but offer yourself to God in a decisive act as those alive, raised from the dead to a new life and your members, all of your abilities, all of your abilities, your ability to communicate, your ability to love, your ability to act loving and kindly toward others, your ability to, do, to, to turn the other cheek if you need to, your ability to, to give when it is hard to give, your ability to love the unlovable, your ability to forgive when, it needs, when you need to forgive. Those are abilities that God says, it should be sanctified and set apart unto me. All those members as instruments of righteousness, you look to God. Verse 14 says, for sin will no longer be a master over you since you are not under law as slaves, no longer slaves under the law anymore, but under unmerited grace. As recipients of God's favor and mercy. Unmerited. We didn't earn it. We didn't earn it. It wasn't something that we worked hard to get. God gave it to us. And so it's unmerited. And so we receive it under God's grace. And verse 15 says, what then? Are we to conclude Shall we sin because we are not on the law, but under God's grace? Paul says, certainly not. Now, why is that important? Because I, I, I see and I've heard it taught by men of old, men like Kelly Varner and, and, and uh, uh, other men of his, of his age group that, that taught this for many years, that there, if, you, if you're on a road, there are two ditches on each side of the road. One is the ditch of, of li license, uh, license. And one is the ditch of legalism. Both of them will kill you. Okay? Both of them will kill you. You live your life in certain ways. Both of them are bound up in some type of slavery. But the one I want you to focus on tonight is the one of license. That license of being able to do what you want to do, act the way you want to, live a certain way, and kind of live free, free, and live any way you want to and think it's okay with God. That is not how God wants us to live. That's not the freedom that he wants us to have. Now, the, the other one over here, the, the legalism and, and that staunch uh, religious type attitude, it'll kill you also. But I'm not focusing on that tonight. I want to focus on the other one. Because that one right now I see in the body of Christ is really hurting us a whole lot. The albums, both of them are hurting us, but this one is really hurting us. Verse 16. You do not know that when you continually offer yourselves to someone to do his will, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey. Either slaves of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness, right standing with God. So again, it says... We are slaves to that which we obey, basically. What we yield ourselves to is what we become a slave to, a servant to. But thank God, verse 17, but thank God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient with all your heart to the standard of teaching in which you were instructed and to which you were committed. 
18 says, and having been set free from sin, you have become the slaves of righteousness, of conformity to God's will and purpose. Now, I read all that because I felt like it needed to be read and us to hear it and to see it as you're reading your own Bibles. And just be reminded that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are freed to be sons and daughters of God, yielding ourselves to God. Now, I know this sounds hard. And I know uh, those who are young believers, those who have just kind of came into the kingdom, if you are hearing this and you live the way you want to live for many years, this might sound hard and it might even sound like a struggle with uh, even t- taming your tongue. Because sometimes, you know, we, we grew up and you said what you want to say, the way you want to say it, and you had a little attitude in how you said it, and you felt like it was okay to be able to do that. Some of us grew up, you know, treating people in certain ways, and, and uh, when we got mad, we said what we wanted to say, and we turned our back and kept on going, and we, and we thought we were good because you were honest and you were truthful, but you were not loving in how you did it. Listen, friends, I get you. I'm still struggling with my own stuff that I'm learning how to let God work in me. But I'll tell you, there's some help for us. Jesus gave us a a great example of how we should view overcoming our internal struggles. It is a picture of discipleship. And I use that word discipleship because that word right there is what he wants to do in us and with us as a community, as a people. He made disciples and those disciples Those guys are are the ones who changed the world. He started the process. Then he trained some other folk to be with them. And that discipleship he did with them is what made them ready and able to impact the culture. Discipleship is a lost word many times in our current culture. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. And, and again, this is, this is what Jesus said to us when, he, when, it, when it comes down to how we overcome our own internal struggles. He said, come to me. Verse 8, 28 says, come to me. All who are weary and heavenly burdened. And this is the Amplified Bur- uh, Bible again. It says, by religious rituals that provide no peace. And give, and I will give you rest. Refreshing your souls with salvation. I'm going to read that again. It says, come to me, all who are weary and heavily burdened by religious rituals that provide no peace. And I will give you rest, refreshing your souls with salvation. Verse 29, 29 says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, following me as my disciple." For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest, renewal, blessed, quiet for your souls. Now, I'm going to break that down because there's a lot in there that I want to actually to talk about. Uh, But the first thing is Jesus said, come to him. Come to him. Discipleship is a, a relationship discipleship doesn't happen from a distance is it happens people getting together people having uh having a heart for god and having a, a desire to learn from him so jesus says come to me all who are what heavenly burden who are weary from what your religious traditions, your, trad- your, ri- your rituals, your religious rituals. And listen, we always think of church when we think of ritual- rituals, but listen, we all got rituals that don't even relate to church that keep us from actually having peace in our soul. You know, sometimes it has to do with addictions. You know, many of us have challenges with eating food sometimes. That's a religious ritual. Why? Because we look to food sometimes as our scapegoat from the, 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 the hardships of the world. We turn to food or we turn to looking at television or we, or we turn to drinking alcohol or we, we turn to sex or we turn to different things that are our, our escape, our escape from the challenges of our soul. Those are religious rituals. 
He says, listen, if you're weary from those things, if you have a heavy burden from dealing with all those things and they don't provide you peace, come to me and I will give you rest, refreshing your souls with salvation. Then he says something else that may not sound like freedom, but I tell you, it is freedom. Let me tell you why. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, what is a yoke? You know, in our day and age, uh, not many of us have seen the, 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 the demonstration of farming like it used to be done back in the day where you had oxen that would plow your, your, your row and plow the ground and, and get up all the fallow uh, soil and make it actually look um, like it needs to, be, needs to look in order to plant uh, seeds and things of that nature. So I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like. Uh, Jonathan, come on up here. And uh, my son Jonathan is going to come help me out a little bit. And so we're going we to count it. This is my boy. So, we, so he and I are going to act like two oxen. I'll be the big oxen and he'll be the little ox. Okay. And usually in this kind of scenario, when they hitch a big ox to a little ox, they're trying to teach the little ox how to plow, how to, how to plow a straight row. And so Jesus says right here, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Follow me as my disciple. So if you look at this right here, so uh, uh, a yoke was a, was a um, mostly wooden in, in that day type of device that, were put, that was put around the necks of the oxen. So I'm going to use my arm as the yoke from Jonathan, and then you assume that there's a yoke on my neck also, and we're together. And so he and I will we'll be moving together over here, plowing the road, and usually the big ox is kind of moving along and, and has the little ox moving. And if the little ox wants to try to go off to, to the right, the, little, the big ox, you know, he keeps him with me, and he keeps on going. If the little ox wants to go and stop, he drags him along and he keeps him from moving to other places and he takes him on down the road where he needs to go. And so that little ox that is immature, the little ox that's not very wise in how he does things is trained and mentored by the big ox. He's learning. He's growing. He's maturing. He's taking on the same attitude of the, of the big ox. He sees how the big ox is plowing and, and doing his job, and, and he's learning and being discipled by the big ox. And so Jesus uses that same analogy. Thank you, Jonathan. Jesus uses that same analogy when he's talking about us as believers. He says, hey, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why do we need to learn from Jesus? Because we need to unlearn Many of the things that we thought was how life should be done. We need to unlearn many of the things that we thought were the way to go. The Bible talks about, you know, many of the thoughts of men, you know, they think they, they have these thoughts about what, which way they should go, but they all lead to destruction. So let's, let's just look at that. And Jesus is saying, listen, there's some smart people out there. I mean, people go to school, they go to educate, they get a lot of good education. They go to colleges. They learn a lot of different things. Some people don't. They go to tr get, get training in different ways. But there's a lot of smart people out there. He's even saying, even you smart folk, with all your degrees, and I got degrees too, you know, I, we can put them on the wall and show them, but, but that doesn't matter when it comes down to living life in true freedom. What matters is that we are learning from him. And so Jesus says, come on, yoke yourself. You who are heavily burden you who are weary come on i want to give you rest i want to refresh your soul and give you salvation from the tyranny of life the tyranny of the power of sin come yoke yourself to me and let me show you how to plow your row of life let me show you how to plow your row and it how it keeps you in the straight and narrow and yes you're going to want to move off to the side don't worry you yoke to me, so I'm going to keep you going the way you need to go. Oh, yeah, you're going to want to stop and not do it. That's all right. I'm still moving, so you're going to move with me. You might drag your feet a little bit, but that's okay. I'm the big ox. You're the little ox. I'm going to keep you going. You might drag a little bit, but I'm going to keep you going. And I'm loving on you the whole time. The whole time, the, the, the 
big ox is focused. The big ox says, I know where I'm going. I have the destination. I see the, I see the bullseye. And the little ox don't have a clue. Even though we went to universities or we got schooling here, we don't really always have a clue as to how we should live our lives. And so Jesus says, come on. Hook yourself to me. Learn from me. And that's where your freedom is going to be. That's where the freedom that I want to give you is coming. And that's where the refreshing to your soul is coming. And he also said right here, he says, take your yoke upon me and learn from me. Follow me as, as my disciple, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest. Then he said, in my parentheses, it says renewal. Renewing of your mind will come when you yoke yourself to the Lord, when you submit yourself to discipleship. Renewing of your mind about how you should live, renewing your mind from even traumatic experiences you may have experienced as a child or even later in life. Renewing of your mind about how you should relate to, to husband and wife relationships. Renewing of your mind of how you should raise your children. Renewing of your mind of how you should look at yourself. Sometimes you look at yourself the wrong way. Sometimes you look at yourself as not able to do things. God says, I will renew your mind as you yoke yourself to me and walk with me and learn of me. That will Bring blessed quiet to your souls, peace to your soul, hope to your soul. So what am I saying? What is the Lord saying? Your freedom will come when you submit every part of your life to his discipleship. True freedom, God's freedom is formed in the crucible of discipleship. If you have not submitted yourself to discipleship, discipleship where you learn, you're learning from the Lord. And many times he sends people, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, apostles, all these different ones as teachers to help disciple you. And you get together with your buddies and friends, small groups. Get with people who know more than you about God and learn and learn and learn. I will also say, if you know you got some hurts and wounds in your heart, get the spiritual counsel you need. Go through things like Sozo and Eman you know, Emmanuel approach and, and also uh, heart sync and all, all these different types of counselings that God has raised these, these leaders up to bring healing to your heart and then get the training to help others. You get the healing so you can heal others. You can help others heal. That's discipleship. We learn how to be healers. We reproduce reproducers that reproduce reproducers. Bishop, you, Bill Hammond used to always say that when it came to training people in the prophetic. You reproduce reproducers that produce reproducers. You know, that's, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be able to reproduce the life of Christ in our lives. Receive from him renewal and hope and blessed quiet. Don't limit him in how he wants to bless you and train you. He wants your commitment and he wants you to get in the yoke with him. So I just want to end with this right here. That freedom is always found in Jesus. And Jesus is not limited into how he can let you experience his freedom. Each one of us is different, and he knows how to yoke himself for you, about commit to that yoking relationship with the Lord, receive the discipleship. I'm sure many of you are in, in, in churches, um, those who are at Dominion, you, you got the leadership there, and, uh, and then you have your own personal relationship with God, and also you can link up with brothers and sisters in the body and just allow the Lord to train you and teach you and love on you and heal you. Uh, he loves you. He wants you to be free. Uh, that's what this is all about. Freedom. Freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And he lives in us. And he wants you free. I appreciate you. I love you. God bless you. Look forward to seeing each one of you next Sunday. Have a wonderful evening. Peace.